Well, hello there, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the IQ video blog and podcast. Today, I have a special guest and longtime friend in the domain industry, Mr. Sean Wilkinson, who is the Chief Operating Officer at Nodoma and also is Head of Premium Names at Dot Cloud. And Sean is going to be able to give us really a really unique, I think, a really interesting perspective on the domain name scene, especially from a European uh, perspective, because that's where Sean lives, uh, just outside of Cologne, Germany, I believe, right, Sean? Welcome. Uh, that's correct, yeah, hi, and thanks for having me, first of all. Uh, yeah, that's right, um, from England, lived in Italy, now live in Germany, so yeah, a bit of perspective on a few different places, I guess. Uh, but yeah, it's really great to, to be here and talk to you. Well, well, thank you for joining us um, today. Um, how did you first get involved in the domain name industry? Well, I, I fell into it, I guess. Uh, it was late 2006. I was, I'd, I'd not been in Germany long. I was looking for a new job. Um, and a friend of mine, um, Simone Ferrakuti, who you also know, uh, currently CEO of Nidoma, back then he was working for Sado. Um, we were we were very good friends at the time. He said, "Hey, you need to apply here. The, uh, it's a good place to work, and so on." And and uh, so I did. Started working in Sado in the in the domain transfer team. Had uh, a couple of really nice years there. Actually, I, I had a, a really really good couple of years where I, I learned a lot about the domain industry. Learned, met some great people. Worked a lot in the UK team for for, for Sado. Um, then then I left at the end of uh, two thousand and nine. Um, which was uh, actually purely for, for personal reasons. Actually, it was not really to do with work or domains. I, I, I just had uh, personal reasons for going away for a while. Um, and then to cut a long story short, I didn't get back into domains again until 2015 um, when I joined uh, Nidoma. And that's where I've been ever since, uh, along with .cloud. Um, so... Yeah, I guess uh, you could say in those intervening years that I wasn't there, the domain industry changed quite, changed quite a bit. Uh, probably you would have seen those changes more than me because you've been in domains all that time, right? Um, yeah, a bit too long. Uh, I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think 26 years now. But, you know, uh, I can understand and empathize, you know, if you're, if, even if you leave the domain industry for some period of time, you know, the pull of it, the gravitational pull, is, is so great. It's hard to resist. So, uh, you know, and, it's, and it's you good know to what see. as well. You know What's what? As well, I would say I, I like I, I liked working in Sado and I liked the domain industry then. I like it even more now. I think it's I think it's even better now than it was then. Yeah, there's there's never a dull moment. You know, every every uh, I always say every year, if you would have told me at the beginning of this year that such and such, you know, would have happened before the end of the year, I would have said you're nuts, you know, and yeah. It happens. It never fails in the domain industry. It always, always happens. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So uh, you got involved with Doc, Doc Cloud. Um, so tell us a little bit about the the story there at, at Doc Cloud. What you got? Going well, uh, Doc Cloud um, is, as you may know, is um, the registry is is run by um, an Italian company called Aruba. Um, Aruba is also the parent company of. Nidoma, where my, let's say my original day job is. And uh, so when they started uh, getting, when they got Dog Cloud and, and, and it was in the launch phase, I started getting involved with it. And this is, you know, pretty much when I started in Nidoma. So what, 2015, 2016? Back then I was just, you know, helping out with, with meeting people at events and, uh, and just getting a feel for things because the new GTLD thing, because I'd been out of the industry uh, for a while, I have to say when the new GTL thing was really getting going completely passed me by because I wasn't paying that much attention to domains until I got back into them. So uh, I started to get a feel for things. And then um, once things started getting up and running, running and um, we wanted to have a proper premium program, uh, then I uh, you know, started basically uh, running that, which at the beginning was a lot of work in terms of pricing domains, 
looking at EPP categories, uh, a real lot of work as well as then before starting brokering some of the, of, of the bigger names. Um, so yeah, well, I also do help as well. Um, I do some work with, with, with partners and registrars and resellers as well, uh, along with uh, Mo, who I'm sure you know, who's the head of .cloud at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, working with her on but then my but my main job is then is, is brokering the premium names yeah and and i should disclose to the audience you know that um the dot cloud is a customer of of iq so uh i, I definitely want to make sure that people understand that but you know the purpose here is really to really to understand and and uh, hopefully the audience can be uh gain some knowledge from your experience from, and when it comes to that, you know, when you were putting together, you know, the premium names uh, program, you know, for dot cloud, I think you mentioned pricing, you mentioned, you know, categories and all that. I mean, is there any particular area that you found to be the most, most challenging, you know, at least at the beginning? At the bit, so at the beginning when, when, when dot cloud was launched, um, the premium names um, by design, were kind of left in a, not uh, not left in a pile, but sort of like okay, we'll we'll deal with these later. Let's not develop a strategy and let's not develop pricing for now. Would rather you know not deal with them too much until we get the the core business up and running of standard registrations, which yeah. made sense. But then you had all these domains for which there was no guidance, if you like. So if people ask about this, what do we do? And if that's and if you've got if you're a domain if you've got ten names. That you haven't got prices for, you haven't decided what you want to do with it's fine. But when you've got thousands, it was a lot of work to um, basically to price them. Is 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 the thing uh, in terms of the first year price? Because we we abolished uh, premium renewals pretty early on. That was one of the things we did. We decided to do across the board because um, we used to have premium renewals and that, and then we changed the standard. But of course, like like. Almost all of the the new GTLDs we had a, a premium portfolio um, of of premium names, keyword names, and so on that uh, we weren't just going to put on standard sale. But of course, you need to have an idea of how much you would sell them for. And right, it was a lot of work and a lot of I don't want to say shooting in the dark, but a lot of when you've got thousands and thousands of names, you if if you decide to analyze each individual name in real depth before giving it a price, you, I, I would still be doing it now, you know? So um, there was some degree of, yeah, I, again, shooting in the dark would be wrong. That would be going over the top, but um, we really had to do some, okay, let's just throw some prices down and let's see how it goes. And then when an inquiry came in, it was like, actually I've changed my mind on that one. That should have been higher or that should have been lower. <laughs> um, right. So that that was the challenge at the beginning. We ended up maybe selling a couple, of, certainly some names that got in, put into EPP and then were bought through registrars. Where I thought on on reflection, I probably should have asked a bit more money for that one. Um, some that maybe we thought, no, actually, now looking again, no, we've actually priced that way too high. Let's reduce it. So just 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 assigning prices and, and deciding on a price strategy for so many names at, at one time was, I would say, the biggest challenge. Yeah, I think uh, that's a common uh, that's a common comment. Uh, I guess that uh, yeah. that I hear is you know the pricing, especially you know the the scale, depending on the amount of premium name inventory a registry you know wishes to to hold uh, and to to maintain. And just for the uh, for the for those in the audience that may not be as experienced, uh, when you were talking about uh, the premium renewal pricing strategy. Um, what I'm what I'm hearing and is was that you had a high high uh, strategy and you went to a high low and so to the to the audience um, you can confirm if I'm saying this correctly is that uh, you know Sam if you priced a premium name at one thousand dollars to buy it uh, initially for the initial registration the renewal was also one thousand dollars per year uh, as opposed to the standard price for a dot cloud name which is uh, I'm sure far lower. Uh, so that that price that would be paid instead of a thousand dollars might be twenty five or ten or something, right? Yeah. So it's 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 just gone up. It's now um, it depends on your registrar, of course, but around sort of between fifteen and, and twenty for for a renewal now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just because some people in the audience may not be familiar with with of the course. concept, I thought it'd be good to, to clear that up. But uh, yeah, no, yeah, that is something that I remember. 
uh, sitting in a room, you know, uh, with with um, with other clients, where uh, you know you're, you're, and I'm going back. I'm going back years, you know, where every you got seven or eight people in a conference room for the entire day, going through you know lists of names, trying to categorize them and figure out how you might you might price them. Uh, and I, I think that that process definitely has evolved. You know, over the years, with various tools and being able to look at you know comparable sales, uh, and to yeah. be able to also to you know to understand the demand and the demand forecast. That's um, right. Yeah. Do you That's do you reprice your names? Um, uh, do you take a look at them on a periodic basis and and reprice them, or or do you um, pretty much leave them where they are? So we haven't ever gone through the whole lot and reprice them. What we'll occasionally do is um, say, okay, here's a, a category or a sector or, or something that uh, let's say has suddenly become newsworthy or, uh, you know, where we say, okay, actually maybe the circumstances in the world have changed. So maybe that, the, the prices of those particular domains, maybe we should look at and reprice and maybe something that we had as a standard domain for going for a few that might've been going for, for a very low price before, suddenly it's a term that becomes in vogue and, and, and means something that it didn't before. So, hey, maybe we need to look at reserving this and putting it in premium and at raising its price and what have you. Um, so that's the sort of thing we do rather than looking at all of repricing the whole thing. Yeah. Have, have you have you noticed any any particular trends in in naming or premium names or just within dot cloud cloud itself that you've you've um, sort of, uh, taken hold? Well, um, I think the thing with cloud is right. It's so the cloud sector, the cloud computing. Cl uh, everyone, you, you know, we have the great cloud fest event that uh, a lot of us are also uh, connected with. Um, it's a niche sector but a growing one um, in the sense that, you know, if you walked, you know, if I walked out onto the street in my village where I live and asked people about cloud in the sense of what well, we understand by cloud, not, not weather clouds, but cloud as a, yeah, more people than not would not have any, wouldn't know the first thing about it. Right. Yeah. Um, but within, but it's a sector that's growing and it's a niche, but a valuable niche, I would say. And one that's becoming more and more of a part of people's lives um, as time goes on. So, um, so I would say sections of everyday life that are having more and more to do with cloud are the areas that are really interesting for us. Um, things like um, the energy sector would be one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I, I, my my biggest uh, premium sale so far, my biggest brokered premium sale was uh, Energy Cloud last year, which uh, was fifty thousand dollars, right? Um, Excellent. Yeah. So that's an example of a sector where cloud-based services and a service like the energy sector, which has always been there, that that connection between them is is getting more and is getting there's becoming more of more of a connection between those two sectors. That that's an example of one. And, and, you know, there'd be others as well, you know, other software as a service things that software, which was something you downloaded onto a computer, maybe now it's cloud-based, you know, data storage and things like that, are the obvious ones. Um, so anything where there's been something that's been there all the time, but is now becoming more and more either cloud-based or having a connection to that cloud, uh, cloud industry are, are the more interesting ones, I would say. Well, that, that makes me feel good because... Um... Um, I, I kind of noticed uh, sort of a trend in sort of business to business, sort of cloud computing type of operations, sort of an industrial cloud and yeah. uh, started registering some names myself, you know, in, in that area, <laughs> disclosure, okay. you know, but yeah. I mean, that uh, I, actually I didn't even, uh, I wasn't asking the question because of that, um, but it just, it reminded me of, of uh, just uh, made me feel good. <laughs> But, uh, but, I, <laughs> but yeah, I think, you know, because of the pandemic, I mean, all kidding aside, I mean, the, um, you know, with the pandemic and the sort of the, just the, the, the incredible, you know, migration to online services and people, you know, being forced to, to, to deal with uh, an online, you know, workday experience. Uh, yeah. 
it seems to, to me, you know, would benefit um, anyone who's, you know, in the, the cloud computing sector. And then of course for, for dot cloud and just noticing the, uh, the zone file and domain registrations, it seems as though that dot cloud has uh, been able to, to grow as a new GTLD, you know, in the last, uh, actually consistently, but, but over the, the, the past year, um, do you attribute yeah. any of that specifically to any particular thing or, or trend? I mean, I guess, I, I guess um, the pandemic could be a factor there. I, I think more likely, I think, is the fact that the cloud, the whole cloud sector is a thing that's becoming more and more of a part of, of, of people's lives, as I, as I said before. Um, you know that, you know, everyone, I mean, the pandemic, obviously, like you said, has driven people online. Um, but online, the actual word is a good example of that's a good TLD, right, where it's something, it's a good example of that, but you go around and everyone knows the word online. Right. Yeah. But not everyone knows about um, cloud computing. Right. But the trend of people knowing about cloud computing and also needing cloud computing and being involved with it is only going to get more and more as 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 time goes on. Right. Yeah. So that um, gives us, you know, good hopes for the future that as as cloud as a thing grows, as a concept grows, then dot cloud can grow. And also, I think what's good for, for, for us also is that um, dot .cloud is, is a TLD that lends itself to purchasing and, and usage. Um, so what that means is for us is that we have a very good renewal rate, um, which is also, I mean, it's not just about the first registrations, right? We want people to keep renewing these domains. And we have a very good renewal rate. You know, we have a, you know, the average, it's only like the average amount of dot clouds domains that one person possesses is like 1.6 or something at the moment so it's not a load of people in general getting a load of dot cloud domains to register them and then probably let them drop the next year um, people are registering to use them which which we like because it, it keeps re it keeps the renewal up right yeah yeah uh, for sure and um you're involved with it with uh nadoma which uh, I believe is is also a part of the Aruba family, correct? That's correct. Yes, actually, before Dot Cloud was yes, since uh, yes. So again, my 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 good friend Simone founded Nidoma. Yeah, I, it was 2011, I think it was now. Um, and in any case, uh, yeah, I I joined there in 2015. Um, started doing a lot of different things, a lot of brokerage, a lot of um, you know business development. Yeah. Um, you know, do working a lot also with back ordering and registration customers. Um, so that's been my day job really for most of the time. It's only really in the last, um, I would say, three to four years that Dog Cloud has begun to take begun to take up a lot more of my time. So I kind of uh, balance both of those things right now. Yeah. Um, the reason why I was asking is because um, I, you know I was taking a look at uh, at the site again and and notice you know the the premium names, um, brokerage and in sales and all that. So I was just wondering, you know, overall, you know, including Doc Cloud in the mix, you know, what you are seeing uh, from, you know, your perspective overall in terms of new GTLD sales and, and premium sales, and also from a from a perspective, you know, from Europe. Um, very yeah. curious to to get your your thoughts on that. Well, uh, they, I would say, you know, the vast the vast majority of our brokerages is. is I, I mean, it's still with either .com or, or with um, CCTLDs. Right. Um, okay. Uh, like, yeah. If we leave if we leave .cloud aside for one second, um, yeah. It, it, yeah. With my Nidoma hat on, I I really don't do that much. Uh, there's not. I don't really do that much brokerage for for other um, new GTLDs, um, which I think in Europe is maybe the demand for them hasn't. Um, I wouldn't say it hasn't taken off, but maybe um, in terms of the secondary market, it hasn't taken off as much as um, as 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 with you know we. I guess with Europe, the thing is, there's always been that thing, right? Of um, there's already there's the CLD, CCTLDs have had such a strong presence. Always, you know, you've always had an alternative to .com over here. Um, I remember when I first got back into domains in 2016, and I started going to conferences again, and. A lot of the discussions were, you know, dot com versus new GTLDs, right? Um, but the thing is, for Europeans, it's never it wasn't dot com versus new GTLDs because there was always CCTLDs in the mix as well. So 
uh, new GTLDs had to compete with two things over here rather than one, which uh, for, I guess from a US perspective, maybe you could you could certainly say that better than me. But um, .com dominates so much even now, right? So um, the idea of it wasn't like for us suddenly there's um so, oh suddenly you wake up one morning and there's competition to dot com um, because for us there's always been dot, dot competition to dot com because of the maybe maybe it's obviously it's limited to each country obviously it Italians register dot it and the Dutch register dot nl so they don't have the crossover appeal that dot com is but within each particular market there's always been at least two valid and good uh, options for any business or any person before new GTLDs came along. So yeah, I, I would say that's the difference. Yeah, you make a great uh, point there, Sean. Um, it, I think it just kind of confirms in, 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 you know, what my early on experience was in this industry, just going back into the 1990s, you know, in the early 2000s, um, which uh, was a heavy involvement in, in what was going on in the CCTLD space. Uh, and it seemed to me uh, back then, and, and it still is apparent now, you know, that exactly, you know, what you're saying, uh, you know, where a CCTLD, um, you know, is in existence, and especially if the registration activity is unrestricted, meaning that you don't necessarily have to have, you know, uh, a local presence or a, you know, business registration or, or whatever that, you know, might be. That, that was the reason why those CCTLDs did so well early on, actually, against .com. And, but I did notice, you know, way back when uh, that, you know, .com gained a lot of strength in countries, you know, where that registrations were restricted or severely restricted, you know, and, and over time, you know, that's, that's changed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, actually, one thing I've always said, and I, I've even, you know, I've been done speeches at various places, you know, Nominate was one where I, I did a keynote speech. And I said, to, I always say to people that from a domain investor point of view, I think in CCTL, these are often quite underrated in terms of people, especially Europeans, not looking, not looking outside their own CCTLD. Purely in terms of if you if you want someone who wants to get domains to sell them or whatever, um, or, or park them or whatever, I I think um, especially as I say especially in Europe because we have the culture of CCTLDs over here, um, especially investors restrict themselves to their own own CCTLD too much. Yeah. Um, especially if you've got if you can find someone and uh, you know this is not me trying to blow my own trumpet or anything, uh, but someone who can help you who speaks various languages. Uh, linguistic knowledge can help you spot a lot of different trends in a lot of D, uh, TLDs where maybe you can get in before someone else will realize that that's a good domain. Yeah. Um, and a good example is um, anglicism. So words in English that, you know, as you know, more and more find their ways into a uh, foreign language get adopted by um, other languages, um, in, especially in the computer space, right? Um, yeah. and, and on the online space. Um, so if, if words that they're new in English, maybe people don't know them in other countries yet. And that's an example of something where if, if you're quick and if you have the, the linguistic knowledge and, and, and you're prepared to go outside of your own TLD, maybe you can get some, you can sneak in and get some good bargains there. This is something uh, it, it, that I recall uh, talking about to customers back in 1998, 1999, <laughs> you know, at least in the United States. Uh, with a company I had back then. And it was basically saying, you know, you may have registered your name in .com, you know, but are you aware that there are, you know, at the time, you know, 150 plus, you know, country code top level domains, you know, where your brand is at risk, you know, and, and you know, back then that was a harder sell um, uh, just because, you know, the cost in, in, uh, in, in doing all that, you know, back, back then. And it wasn't even for a domain investing purposes more than for brand protection. But yeah, yeah definitely from a domain in investing perspective, I think um, that, that I agree with you, it is often overlooked, you know, is, is looking at in local language, you know, for that particular TLD, you know, some, some domain names that it could be quite um, interesting. To, to people that want to operate in, in those areas. I've done the same even with, even with Chinese domain names, uh, yeah. especially, 
you know, in, in, in those areas. Um, really interesting perspective on that. Well, you mentioned that I mean, you speak a number of languages, uh, which ones? So, uh, yeah, English, obviously, uh, German, I speak fluent German, fluent Italian, and my, my wife is from Mexico, so my Spanish has been sort of slowly, since we met, I, I've been trying to better my Spanish. Um, I now watch Spanish kids TV with my daughter to, to pick up new words. Uh, watching baby programs for babies in Spanish is really helpful, actually. Um, <laughs> that, that's, uh, I definitely recommend that for anyone who's trying to pick up a language, watch baby programs. Um, so, uh, so I would say I speak three and a half plus, uh, I did French at school. So I've got a, ver a small smattering of French and a very, very small smattering of Swahili from my time in Kenya. Um, so it may I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do business in that language. <laughs> yeah. I'm interested. Um, you mentioned Kenya and I'm, and I, I believe you have a, uh, a charity that, um, you're involved with, uh, to uh, quite a large extent that that does work there. Could you uh, elaborate on that? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so quite a lot of people in the domain industry uh, know about this already because uh, I, I've done various um, charity events uh, at, at the old domain in Europe and, and at Namecon and so on. Um, I, when I left Sado back in at the end of 2009, um, I took some time out to go and volunteer in, in Kenya as a teacher. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to give you the short version of this, otherwise this podcast will go on forever. Um, <laughs> the short version is that uh, when I came back, I, I founded a charity to help to 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 raise money to to set up an official school for the kids that I'd been working with, which is uh, in a very small, well, a very poor part of of um, Mombasa, which is the second city in Kenya. Um, so. Uh, I set up a charity to encourage people to donate um, to to building the the actual school, and then also um, to to uh, make contributions towards uh, teachers' wages um, and and lunches for the kids, things like that. Um, so that's kind of grown. So um, yeah, we started off with about uh, thirty five kids when I was working there. We've got uh, over two hundred now. Um, and we are currently, it's been a long, slow process, but we are close to finishing building a second school, uh, which would be a high school. So the current one that I've, that, that's been there all the time, it's, I guess the equivalent in the U S would be elementary school. Uh -huh. Um, and the new one's going to be a high school. So the kids who go to our school can then continue their education with us. Um, so yeah, that's been going on now. Uh, yeah, pretty much. In, at least in, in an unofficial capacity since 2010. And the charity got made official in 2014. I think it was 13, 14, uh, when I actually founded it in terms of an actual official charity. Um, so uh, basically I run the charity in terms of the, the fundraising and accounting, all that stuff. And uh, there's a local lady who, who actually runs the school itself. She, you know, she's the principal of the school. So be, between us and, and her husband, we run the, the school. Wow. That, that is really um, amazing and, and just lovely, lovely to hear. Can you, what is the name of the, of the charity? We can maybe put up a URL on the, the screen. If sure. Folks um, that. It, it's Hope Children's Center is the name of the school. Um, the, I, we, well, I can certainly, uh, we can, be, I'd be very grateful if we put up a URL. As someone who works in the domain industry, I'm a bit embarrassed of the URL itself because it's got a lot of, uh, a lot of dashes in it. And you know what we think about dashes in, in the, the main industry. Um, but uh, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's something that has brought me a lot of joy and pleasure over the year. And I mean, obviously I don't do it, for, it's not for myself, but as a, as a side effect, it's really made me a happier person to, to be involved with. Um, I, I try to get to Kenya at least every couple of years. I didn't, I wanted to go last year, obviously COVID made that impossible. Um, but uh, yeah, it's something that uh, I'm really, really happy to be involved with, um, with both people in the domain industry and in more recent years, um, I'm sure you're aware of the uh, Entrepreneurs for Knowledge um, organization, which um, Soren from, from Namescon and Cloudfest is, is, is heavily involved with. Um, he put me in touch with them a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, having been in touch with them, uh, 
that you know they've included me uh, in their list of projects so that's been a massive help as well um in, especially in terms of uh, building the, the new school uh, which as i say is now almost finished that had to be on hold for quite a long time also because of covid there, there was lockdowns there where they couldn't we couldn't uh, get the staff to, to carry on building yeah. um but uh yeah so so both both individuals within the domain industry and also in, especially in recent years uh Soren and entrepreneurs for knowledge have been a massive massive help um and yeah i'm i'm, I'm extremely grateful for any for any any help i've ever been given by people within the domain industry and you know it's as i say it's often like a community you know that and uh Every time I've, especially at the NamesCon Europe events, I've I've always tried to do something like a raffle, or we've had a domain auction, or, or whatever. And yeah, the the help is yeah, it's very touching and it's very it's vital as well. It is. It's um, well. Thank you for for sharing all that. I I uh, I, I, I definitely aware of of, of Surin and uh, his activity and involvement uh, with Entrepreneurs for Knowledge, and uh, you know it is really amazing to me. Uh, you just how you know what simple things um, are needed you know if they can be executed and the immense benefit you know that that brings to to children in these areas well Sean thank you so much for um, sharing all that it was really um, I'm glad we had a chance to delve into the to the charity uh, work that, that you're doing and on top of uh, your experiences uh, with premium names and, and dot cloud and and uh, just the, the premium names business uh, in, in general. Uh, thank you so much for um, sharing all that today with us. No, no, and, and thank you very much for having me. And uh, hopefully we'll be meeting up again very soon in person, let's hope. <laughs>